All right, we should be live on the YouTube channel.
connection to the script as you do. Um, because that's also something that sells is, and it's something that, that you can see in the screen is, is their passion for it. And, and the fact that they, they really resonate with the script because if it resonates to them, it'll resonate to the audience. Um, and then how do you typically work with the DP, with the actors, with the screenwriting? What's your collaboration process? Film is a collaborative um, field. Every set is a team. And um, I will touch on this later, but I like to think of each project as not... I, I feel like a lot of people think of a project as like the directors or the writers or the producers. Um, and I don't think that that's the case. I think it's... Um, I think it's everybody's. Every single person who has in some way shaped this story in this film, um, it's their it's their story. Yeah, we've all been kind of ruined by auteur theory, which suggests that the director is the true author of the picture, despite the fact that we've all seen the credit sequences to television and shows and movies that are hundreds of people long, and the director would be nothing without those people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, what is the minimum crew you need to support your work? And what is what equipment will you need? And that's also something that you'll talk about with your, your DP and um, your gaffer. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Jess? I think here, no. I think the, these are the kind of the basic questions. And then I, I do think really getting them in particular when you ask questions around their collaborative process, get them to tell you stories because some, anyone can tell you anything. They're going to be like, I work great with people. I'm a people person, whatever. Everyone loves me that you make them prove it. Make them tell you stories. Tell me a story from, you know, the last time you were on set where a collaboration went really well, or tell me about a situation where a collaboration went really poorly. How did you handle it? Uh, and again, these are kind. These are the kinds of questions that I think don't often get asked because they're they're personal, right? They're about someone's behavior and personality. But we have to understand that you know when you're on a set with you know a crew of people, it is very intimate, and you are very close in this very close knit community for a, a very concentrated period of time. And so, really understanding the personalities of the people that you work with matters. Um, and I don't think, I know there's like a, I feel like there's a kind of a longstanding history of kind of glorifying certain kinds of jerky artistic types and being like, oh, but they're so brilliant. You can find brilliant people who are also kind. You can find talented people who are also good at working with people and making people feel safe. So go ahead and do that. Uh, and you have to vet people for that. Um, so yeah, good. All right. Moving All right. Then questions for your cinematographer. Again, do you have a reel? You know, the cinematographers, they're, they're the look of the film. They, they craft, they, they take your words, they take your story and make it, um, visual. And that's, it's so important to see their previous work because I think that this is another one of the things. I mean, everything is make like would make or break it, right? But cinematographers, um, I don't know. I think there's something about that process that's just very intimate. Does that make sense? Um, so, some more questions to ask: um, What informs your aesthetic decisions from project to project? Again, how do you imagine the world? How do you imagine? you know, the lighting, the colors, um, the, how the camera moves in these moments, um, and uh, where the actors are in relation to the camera. Um, how do you typically work with the director? What's your collaborative process? Again, we talk about, you know, film being really collaborative and the director and the cinematographer will have, um, such, such a such an important relationship throughout that process um so it's really important for that relationship to be extremely collaborative um and then again what's the minimum crew that you'll need to support your work and what equipment you, will you need yeah those are all key and then i would just add going back to the kind of the questions about like these aesthetic decisions really getting at and this is something for both the director and the cinematographer to be able to articulate um, is like, 
how do they approach like the central thematic questions or the tone of your work and how are they going to visualize that right or like that's for the cinematographer somewhat also for the director um definitely they should collaborate about that and then more specifically for the director like you know do you see this like is there a particular acting style that is going to make this script shine um in a way so like really getting into the nitty gritty of the different kinds of like, technical skills and techniques that are unique to each of their trades um, and really making them answer questions that under that show you their artistic process and also very specifically how they see your script because if someone gives you a vision back of your script and you're like Ugh, no, like <laughs> that's not what I imagined at all. Or and sometimes that can be great. Maybe you maybe you get an interpretation that's really exciting. Then you know you can go with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna mention oh. that. Just always be open to to change because I think yes. once you write something, and especially after you've done, you know. 10, 15, 20, however many revisions you've you've done on that, that script. 191. Yeah, 191 revisions um, later, you're going to be so attached to it. It's going to be like your baby, you know? And so um, make sure to be open. Know what you want, but also make sure to be open and know that your cinematographer or your director, they might have some really interesting ideas that could really... Uh, change the shape of your script in all the right ways. Yeah, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, I, for most of my career, I worked um, in close collaboration with my partner, like my life partner, also my business partner. And um, she primarily is a writer. Um, and then I wrote, but then also directed. And one of the things that was very important to me was to like make the shift from like wearing my writer's goggles to wearing my director's goggles. And so a lot of times in the course of directing, I would, even though I know like what we were going for in the script originally, I would have like a new idea or a new take on it. Um, and so then that I would bring that onto set and I would let actors then also play with that, which is another sort of rewriting. And there'd be times I'd come home and my partner would be like, but that's not how I wrote it. <laughs> like, well, um, that's how it is now because to me this is a more exciting take on it um and so yeah i think being open to letting the work blossom and uh letting the collaboration of other excellent artists like make your work shine is so so key i'm so glad you brought that up marlo oh of course yeah good all right moving forward um so this is something that does not get talked about enough um, and so we're going to talk about it because it is something that both Marlo and I value very much. Yeah. Um, and that is creating a safe and inclusive set. And so I think the reason people don't think about this in advance is that they think, well, everybody thinks that they themselves are good people. Um, I'm sure all of you are, but then it's the other people that are the problem. I don't know. Um, but everyone thinks they're a good person. <laughs> And people think naturally people will behave well on set. Uh, and that is definitely not true. Um, so you have to address this explicitly in the choosing of your cast and crew, uh, as well as in the, the culture that you want to establish on your set, which is something you need to talk about with your producer. So all of these things that we're going to talk about now are additional things to actually address with your producer, with your director, with your cinematographer, etc. Um, so what I would say here, number one, when choosing your team, you should make a deliberate effort to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we are just um, at a space where the current sort of system uh, that basically centers white, male, straight supremacy is not okay. It has done irreparable harm to communities of color, to queer communities, to women, to people who are disabled, to immigrants. I could go on and on and on about all of the different communities that have been harmed. And so it is really important to make an actual effort to make opportunities and bring... Um, 
bring marginalized people onto your set. So you need to be thinking, is there equitable gender representation in your cast and crew? Uh, think about this in terms of race, ethnicity, sexuality, ability, etc. cetera. Um, but that's not enough, okay? Because we see, um, sometimes we'll see this, what's called visible representation on the screen, um, but there's not, um, like that, there might not be actual representation in the writer's room, for example, or the, like the set itself isn't inclusive. Uh, and what this means is like inclusion means making the world safe for people who are commonly harmed by the status quo. Uh, so you have to think about how will you make sure that members of marginalized groups are not alienated or harmed on your set. And trust me, I know because students come and tell me this all the time, that happens a lot. It happens in student sets. It happens all the time on Hollywood sets. Um, it happens on independent sets. And again, this happens because people are not explicit about creating a culture where that is simply not um, allowed. Like, you have to be explicit about how, um, how people are going to be valued regardless of their identity. Um, um, and I, I kind of wanted to, sorry, I wanted to yeah, jump please. back on, on what you said about um, making sure that you have a diverse and inclusive writer's room. Um, mm, it, it, yeah. You are, if you have a writer's room, um, if you, like, you're working on something like that, make sure that you have diversity in there because the thing is, you can see your script one way, um, but you, you want this this variety of views, this variety of, of upbringings, this variety of, of experiences to really make your script more complex and just better. Um, and I think that that's just super important. And, and if you're not, uh, if you're writing it yourself, make sure to reach out to people who have different experiences from you and give them your script, ask for feedback from them. Um, people who, yeah, who have different life experiences from you, um, different identities from you. Yeah, and you want those people also on your sets yes. because they also could potentially catch things on set that are problematic. Um, and so you want to have a space where from the get-go, everybody acknowledges that none of us are perfect and that we're all still learning, and that the legacies of things like... The, the legacy of white male supremacy means that we've all, regardless of our identities, have internalized a lot of very problematic thinking. And it, it takes, you know, a village, right? Or it takes a community to at, where we all hold each other accountable. Um, so I've seen, for example, on um, some DePaul sets where, for example, like at the beginning, there will be a discussion about things like gender pronouns and respecting people's gender pronouns. Um, that's important because, again, people do not naturally do that. And actually, there are some people who are actively resistant to that. Um, and so it has to be explicitly stated. Um, yeah, I've seen also people... Uh, I'm not going to go into it, but maybe it'll come up in the questions. Yeah. Um, next, um, I want to talk a little bit about consent. Um, Consent is something, again, that, uh, again, needs to be explicitly thought about prior to going on set. And this doesn't, I mean, I think people mostly think about consent in terms of sex, right? And then now there's this whole movement, finally, of having intimacy coordinators um, who then help craft the sex scenes uh, in a movie or a TV show. Uh, but even if you don't have a sex scene, consent still matters. Um, and so I, I think it's worth thinking about. For sure, if you're doing any kind of intimacy on set, consent is essential. So for I have filmed a lot of intimate scenes uh, over the course of my career, and it was always a part of my practice to, one, on the days we did that, like complete minimization of who is on the set and who is in the room. Because, you know, when actors are doing these scenes, they have to be very vulnerable. And having a bunch of strangers stare at them is uncomfortable and invasive. Um, it also involved um, doing things like talking through and very specifically choreographing every single thing that happened in the scene or would happen in the scene so that the actors could agree to in advance what was about to happen. 
things like that really matter. And having directors and producers who understand that in advance matters. So you need to ask them about that. Um, I would also say that consent matters even in terms of, you know, film and television. We are telling oftentimes deeply personal stories that might bring up people's personal traumas and histories. And you don't know. You don't know what every person on your set is carrying. And so you need to be sensitive and you need to ask questions. And something as simple as, can I ask you this? Like, if you're the director, for example, talking to an actor and trying to get them in a scene, can I ask you about a difficult moment from your childhood? And like, just asking for that permission matters. Um, so make sure that you have, again, these things go back to like when you're assembling your main uh, crew, do the people on your crew understand these crucial things? Because to make good art, people have to be able to be vulnerable. And to be vulnerable, people have to feel safe. I definitely agree. And one more thing that I wanted to add to that is um, even when you're like writing a script um, and maybe it's not your own personal story, maybe it's a story that you heard from a friend or from or that you, you know of, you know, whatever, make sure that it's okay for you to tell that story. Make sure that you um, you have the right to do that, if that makes sense. You don't yeah. want to be telling stories that aren't yours or that you don't know enough about to tell. Um, totally. And I just think that that's just super, super, super important. Yeah, we have a long history, too, of especially, I would say, white people, that yeah. white theft and appropriation of marginalized people's stories. Um, and, and, and then and that's, we, that's like why we get a lot of these stereotypes and, you know, some really, uh, you know, systemic issues that inform our viewer, our, our, our mind, and especially um, with young people and, and how they develop, how they view others. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. All right, second part of our creating safe and inclusive sets. Um, so things you can, again, all of these issues are things you need to address with the team in the pre-production process. And then those things will be carried, having that planning in advance will be carried over into the production process. Uh, additional questions you can ask your producer and your director in particular are things like, have you worked with people outside of your demographic? Because you'll find some people never have. <laughs> um, yeah, they just haven't. And if not, is that like, do you trust this person to be able to take on the responsibility of coming into potentially a more diverse environment? Um, then things like what does consent mean to you and how is it part of your artistic practice? I think if an artist, if a director cannot answer this question, if a producer cannot answer this question, I would not work with them. Um, and then this is the big one. And again, I have, this happens at our, it happens everywhere in the entire industry. Uh, how might you respond to social violence against a marginalized group on set? I mean, have, your producer has to be able to answer that question. What would they do if someone said something racist? What would they do if people were being sexist? What would they do if people were misgendering someone? They have to have an answer to that. Um, just as a little aside, I have I kicked a my one of my producers off set once. They were above me. I kicked them off because they were um, engaging in behavior that was basically sexual harassment, and so I was not. I did not end up getting to work for them anymore, which I didn't want to <laughs> at that point. Yeah. But like, you have to be able to be bold. Um, yeah, and you need a producer who's willing to step in and stand up for all of the members of your crew. Okay. Um, and I, I love how much of a focus you put on um, having creating safe and inclusive sets, Jess. I think, you know, we don't talk about it enough, and I think that this is one of the most important things when it comes to crewing up and when it comes to actually being on set. I agree. And I think, sadly, what most people spend the time thinking about is those questions I had earlier, which is like the equipment, like what camera are we going to use? Yeah. Are we going to put it on a 
or whatever. I don't I forgot all of my technical <laughs> terms. Um, but yeah, they get really fixated on the technical aspects and not a, enough on the human and humane aspects. Um, so yeah, and I do, I just want to reiterate, like when we're making art, that is, it is, it is deeply intimate and vulnerable. And so respecting everybody on set is only going to make whatever art you make so much richer. And one more thing that I wanted to mention, I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, kind of go with that, the idea of the auteur theory um, is taking ownership of your project and being proud of the fact that you were working on this, like whatever project you're on. And this is something that I'm trying to do as a producer right now is trying to get my team to realize that this isn't just my project or my director's project. This is all of ours and and trying to get them to not just say like oh it's marlo's project or whatever but it's, it's theirs um and really taking ownership and being proud and being confident in the fact that you can do this um you can actually you can actually do what you're doing and you know what you're doing and if you don't know you're gonna learn yes yeah, a, set, a film set is a community. Like, you are in community with other people, and that is how it shouldn't be. The issue, I think, a lot of times is that Hollywood is very much a factory model of storytelling, and so it runs on this tight conveyor belt of production, and that that is dehumanizing. Um, and if yeah. you talk to people who work frequently on Hollywood sets, they will often come back and say that very thing. Um so one ways one of the ways to challenge that, um, obviously there are still going to be some aspects of the factory model in terms of like the division of labor, which is really important, uh, again, to ensure the artistic integrity of a film or a TV show. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to like run everyone into the ground. It doesn't mean that you have to be like a cold machine. You can be a community. Um, so yeah, and ownership yeah. of the project by everyone is really key to that. Good. All right. We're getting to the end and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, Marla, do you want to take this one? Um, I can start. Yeah, yeah. Um, so casting call. Um, casting is a huge thing and it's super, it's super difficult. I think we have... There's this there's this idea that um, at DePaul that we we're just gonna like hire our friends because it's cheap labor and whatever you know don't do that <laughs> um, you want to make sure that you first of all again going back to the idea of diversity and inclusion you want to make sure that um, you're finding the people that are best for the role and maybe you know trying to get different readings of of your script. You know, what changes if you change the person's identity, if you change the person's, you know, gender identity or, or um, um, ethnicity, what changes? How does that make the script better? How does that take away from the script? What, um, just thinking about those kinds of questions is really important. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? I'm trying to think of other yeah. things. Yeah. No, a couple of things. I do think what you brought up is really important. I don't recommend doing, like, colorblind casting. I do think you should know in advance, like, what race and gender and everything everyone is. That doesn't mean, though, that something might not, something magical might not happen in the casting room where you're like, oh, my God, this person just came in, and actually now I've rethought this whole thing. That could be very exciting. But as Marlo said, you've got to then rethink everything in their storyline through this new lens of identity yeah. um yeah. and then the other thing i would say is in terms of not just hiring your friends as actors i do think you your crew should probably be all the paul people because you can't pay people because you don't have any money because you're students unless you're rich in which case i don't really know why you're here but anyway <laughs> um <laughs> the in terms of actors one of the things i so i i'm on a couple of like grant uh giving bodies here at depaul and we often see um, students spend the little money they get for grants on stuff on things like food and craft services when really, like, we live in a city full of really talented actors, especially for comedy. Um, and having a name or having an actor or having someone who has just even a tiny bit of fame and... Recognition. Uh, recognition. Name recognition, thank you. Yeah. 
that is going to make your project take your project out of that like oh this is just a student film status to like something higher it's going to completely raise the value of your project so be very thoughtful about your casting and if you can use the massive talent resources we have here in chicago do yeah no that's a really good point um and kind of going back i'm sorry i keep going going back no that's okay um other things but you know you mentioned um oh god i lost my train of thought right there um you you mentioned um Oh God, I like can't remember. Okay, anyway, so I'm working on a project right now, and we, you know, originally the script called it, it was every single person in the script was every character was was white. It was you know a small town, and they were white. I suggested to my director, I was like, Hey, what happens if we make this character African American or you know some sort of minority group? How does that affect her character arc? And I think our script really blossomed in that moment and really made the characters not just these people with wants and needs, but way more complex. Um, mm-hmm. And having, I don't know, I just think I just think we tend to write with the mindset of, okay, this character is going to be white because every character is white that we see on TV. Um, a lot of characters are, at least, and that's yeah. me too as a writer. Like I, I'm not white, and yet my go-to is like, okay, John Smith, you know, whatever the character is, why not make them, why not think about race in, in, in a different way, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we're so conditioned to just write what everybody else is writing. Um, I don't know how, how, what else to say for that, but I just think yeah. that that's too prevalent and we need that to stop. I'm, I'm very much with you. Yeah, that's, and that is a lot of, I talk about that a lot in my classes. Um, and I talk a lot about that in terms of, yeah, at the script level, these decisions need to be made. Um, it can't be, I mean, obviously it can come in later, but I think it's best when you actually think Mm -hmm. through all of those things early on. Yeah. But you definitely at the very least need to consider, um, consider these, these things, um, and, and knowing full well that things might change, um, but they might yeah. not, you know. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so the last thing, just kind of you've done all of this work. And again, pre-production after the script is done is really all about like paving the path towards production, right? And you, the preparation, I cannot emphasize this enough. The preparation that goes into preparing for production is tremendous like it is time consuming it is tedious it is going to keep you up late at night things are gonna fall through people are gonna say commit and then uncommit and you're gonna have to replace them like all sorts of disasters are gonna happen so just know that uh, and know that everything like to have a good experience on set which is what Marlo and I are trying to prepare you to do you need to think through all of the things we just talked about because you're paving the path, you're setting the tone, you're creating the cultural template for your production, um, which ultimately is going to impact the quality of the film or television yeah. thing you make. And, and, and not just planning for what is coming in the moment, like what's happening in the moment, but planning ahead and really making sure that you have a plan for I think this is especially important right now in the midst of this global pandemic. What happens if your DP, you know, tests positive? For, yeah, tests positive for COVID. Um, right. Do you have a backup? What do you do? Um, or like, uh, there's just so many factors, especially right now with with this pandemic, that um, are just difficult. And so you really need to plan ahead. For, for everything and and that goes for now and when this is over just always plan ahead it's just so important in film i feel like yeah 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 if you don't make the plans ahead of time your production is going to be a disaster like it, yeah. it really that's why and i'm really having a good uh i am fortunate i have had some really great producers who just 
take care of every detail so that once like it just it runs in a smooth way that doesn't mean that there's not mishaps but that there's always a way there's always a safety net yeah yes totally um so make sure so as you're nearing the end you want to make sure you have your entire cast and crew and then as marlo mentioned backups especially now uh your budget is final right and then you you know like Everything is budgeted for. They're even, and you're a good producer will budget a little bit for disasters. Mm-hmm. Contingencies. Um, yeah. yeah, contingencies. Um, make sure your schedule is set. Everyone it knows about it. All your locations are secure. Although, again, especially with the pandemic, you want to maybe have backups because you never know. Locations fall through. Same, uh, the and same, then the same goes for equipment too, um, because yeah. especially like I think we always assume that like DePaul's going to give us stuff, but who knows what's going to happen with this pandemic? Who knows if you're going to be able to get DePaul's equipment um, mm-hmm. whenever you want? Yeah, and there are other production houses in Chicago where you can actually rent things pretty floor. affordably. Yeah, ex- that's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, but yeah. So, and knowing all those things, and again, a good producer will take care of all these things for you, um, but it's, you know, it's just something to make sure that is done. Um, so, with that, are there any questions? And I don't know how we found out, find out, because I'm not looking at <laughs> Yeah, I'm not super sure either. So, I'm hoping so Annika... Maybe we'll just... Yeah. We'll just wait for a little... Know, maybe, maybe Annika left. No, I'm right here. <laughs> Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't see any questions right now, but I have one. If oh, you, perfect. Yeah. Um, sure. You sure. Guys, uh, had mentioned about um, you know, like Chicago has such like a vast amount of like um people for casting and stuff like that, especially like a lot of talent here. Do you have any like recommendations on how a student or someone would be able to find those types of people? Backstage, because I feel like the industry standard, um, get in touch with casting agencies, um, and also go see productions. I mean, obviously, right, not right now, but I think (laughs) go see, like, DePaul's theater school even, like, we have a good theater school. Go see some of their productions, um, get in touch with the people who you, whose performances you really enjoyed, um, Pay attention to the Chicago stand-up scene. Yes. Uh, if you're looking for, actually, and I would say, I mean, a lot of comics are really good at drama roles too, but like the, we have a very vibrant stand-up scene. Um, so that's another place to look. Um, yeah, that's something... backstage is good. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, I think we have a big focus on like, okay, let me get every person on the crew's numbers and, you know, contact information, but also remember that you're going to have to cast another thing at some point. So if you're working on a set, like as a PA or whatever um, position you're on, try to start talking to the talents, try to start talking to the, those actors and actresses and, and, you know, get their contact info and see if down the line you have a script and you're like, Oh, I remember this person from this one set that I was on. She was really talented. She had, um, she delivered, her lines in the same way that I think this character would, you know, mm-hmm. I think we have this focus on networking within the ba- the behind the scenes um, aspects of film. And, and I think that that's, I think that we should focus also on talent. Yeah, absolutely. I would also recommend, I mean, there are, there's a lot of independent television here in Chicago and you can look up series um, by Chicago artists on YouTube or Vimeo Or you can look on OTV, which is Open TV, which is a platform for independent intersectional um, television. um, And you can find local performers there. Um, You can also, oh, like, honestly, like TikTok. Like, my God, the kinds of talent that is happening on TikTok right now, you could could cast a whole, whatever, short film with, like, Chicago Big based tiktokers and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna everyone's gonna know about you basically no. because <laughs> tiktok i think is a great a marketing tool um uh-huh. 
and B, it's a great place to, yeah, just reach out to people and see who's there. I'm trying to, I'm currently trying to find somebody to cover a song for a short film through TikTok because I think they, if they have a big enough following, that's also marketing. Like it's, it's, I don't know. I think social media is a really weird and interesting way to connect and to find, I don't know, to find talent. Yes, no. I've done that my whole, I mean, so much of doing independent television is reliant on social media. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of my strategy, because also, and we don't really touch on this in this because it's like the pre-production thing. And I'm assuming there's going to be like a distribution and marketing talk at some point. I don't know, but I tend to think you should actually also, since we have time, you should also actually be planning out your distribution and marketing strategy in these pre-production times. Um, And so thinking about like, okay, I'm going to get a bunch of TikTok talent and then I'm going to have to push. Yeah. Yeah, Also because that, that, that does help with funding. If, if you have those names Mm -hmm. attached, um, people who know them might want to donate, might want to help fund your, your film. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, not right now, but uh, I was looking back at the YouTube video, and I think your intros cut out, like, the audio for it, so if you want to oh. introduce yourself again, I'm so sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do mine really quickly first. Um, again, sure. So, uh, I'm Marla Varina, I'm a showrunner concentration, a writer, a producer, uh, I'm interested in I'm interested in writing episodic work that reaches LGBTQ plus viewers, especially people of colors in those communities. Um, and really, I just want to tell the stories that that need to be told that provoke real human emotion and real global change. Um, I, I seek to be an instrument of change, and I believe that through film we can accomplish great things. We can provide visibility and representation to those in minority groups, to the LGBTQ community, especially people of color. Um, I I want to tell stories that help end the stigma that surround mental health. I mean, if a film can get even just one person to take a step back from the ledge or to put down the knife or the gun or whatever, then it might just be a film worth making. Yeah, I love that. Uh, And I am just King. I am a professor of screenwriting here at DePaul. I have been a filmmaker and an educator for the past 20 years. Uh, I spent the first part of my teaching career in public high school uh, and then made the shift to college. Uh, Over the course of my teaching career, I have also um, forged a career primarily in independent television, although I did start in more traditional ways with shorts and then features, um, both narrative and documentary. Um, But I've spent the latter most part of my career in independent television where kind of like Marlo, uh, the stories that I have told have centered around um, LGBTQ plus people um, and uh, really kind of lifting up uh, marginalized voices and queer ways of being and thinking uh, as a challenge to our white supremacist, masculinist, heteronormative culture. Um, And then most recently, um, I had actually been slated to make a bunch of films last spring, but then the pandemic hit. Um, And right now I am writing a book um, that basically looks at how the foundations of screenwriting are inherently white, uh, masculine, and straight, um, and how they perpetuate harm and how we can rethink those paradigms to create equity and inclusion in a structural way, not just in a visual representational way. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, we are good. Yes, thank you so much for joining us, to, to both of you. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, yeah of course. Great. And, and I just want to say, I think Marlo and I are an excellent team and that we should be asked to do lots of these. I think so, too. (laughs) Awesome. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. All right.